left to right. Once again, the theme of this program is what? I want to hear you well. Must I marry you? Must I marry you? Thank God that during the quiz competition, we have considered the marriage and the family life of Jacob. And you will discover that a series of questions were brought from the story of the marriage and the family life of that man. If you turn to Genesis chapter 29, where the old story began, Genesis chapter 29, please will you open your Bible if you have one. Genesis chapter 29. You don't have the Bible to write something down and you need somebody to help you with one. I think you better signify so that somebody can assist you. Alright, so those who have extra Bibles, just look at those who are stretching for their hands and see how you can assist them. Genesis chapter 29. I read from verse 15. And Laban said unto Jacob, Because thou art my brother, shouldest thou therefore serve me for naught? Tell me, what shall thy wages be? And Laban had two daughters. The name of the elder was Leah, and the name of the younger was Rachel. Leah was tender-eyed, but Rachel was beautiful and well-favored. And Jacob loved Rachel and said, I will serve thee seven years for Rachel, thy younger daughter. And Laban said, It is better that I give her to thee than that I should give her to another man. Abide with me. And Jacob served seven years for Rachel, and they seemed unto him but a few days, for the love he had to her. And Jacob said unto Laban, Give me my wife, for my days are fulfilled, that I may go in unto her. And Laban gathered together all the men of the place, and made a feast. And it came to pass in the evening, that he took Leah his daughter, and brought her to him. And he went in unto her. And Laban gave unto his daughter Leah silver, his maid for an unmaid. And it came to pass that in the morning, behold, it was Leah. And he said to Laban, What is this thou hast done to me? Did not I serve with thee for Rachel? Wherefore then hast thou beguiled me? And Laban said, It must not be told done in our country to give the younger before the firstborn. Once again, everybody, what is the theme? I want to hear you loud. Must I marry you? Now, you have read a story now. Jacob came into the house of an uncle called Laban. And from the story, you will discover that Laban had two daughters. Can you mention their names? One, Rachel and Leah, or Leah and Rachel, whichever way. All right. Leah and Rachel, because Leah was the eldest. And the Bible says, Jacob, when he saw the two of them, he saw that Leah was tender-eyed. If you want to put it in a, in a raw word, you will say that the, the eyes of Leah, or the face, the facial appearance of Leah was a dull one. She was not sharp. She was not attractive. She was not charming. She doesn't look beautiful in the way people would say somebody is beautiful. 
But Rachel was beautiful and well favored. Rachel was charming. And the Bible says that Jacob set his eyes on Rachel. And he said, I'm going to marry Rachel. And I will serve for seven years. Now you will notice something. Uh, I love that in the question and answer session. They did not tell him the bride price to pay. He was the one that charged himself. Because he was carried away with the beauty he saw. And he charged himself. How many years of hard labor? Seven years. Are there brothers here that have been laboring, running after a girl for seven years? That the time you are supposed to spend doing some other things, you are wasting away your life. Seven years at labor. He was laboring. Now, but the Bible says, when he completed his service, he said, now my service is over. Give me my wife. I want to go in unto her. Hallelujah. Now, at night, the Bible says, instead of taking Rachel to him, who did they take to him? How come that he didn't know? Somehow I was asking myself whether they used to put up the light on wedding night so that you will not see. And the lady came in and they started romancing, romancing, and he slept with her overnight and both of them slept off. And early in the morning as they were waking up, Jacob was excited and he said, Hello, Rachel. I really enjoy you throughout the night. Light was not on. And the lady said, Oh, sorry. I'm not Rachel. I'm Leah. <laughs> I said, What? What? What are you talking about? And then he quickly went on and put on the light and saw that it was Leah. And he was mad. And he went to his father in law and said, What have you done to me? And he said, no, don't ask questions. In our country, a younger does not get married before the elder. And you see, I started asking myself, this lady that is called Leah, somebody was cutting with your elder sister, I mean your younger sister. The person never saw sign of any love for you. And then your family said they are packaging you for him. Must he marry you? I was thinking that this lady would have said, Ah, this man has been in our house for the past seven years. He will not even smile to me. He doesn't have any love for me. I don't want to marry him. But she too was desperate. Tell somebody and say, Don't be desperate. No, tell somebody close to you very well. She was desperate. And so as they were arranging, they were saying, don't mind your sister, Rachel. This man will marry you. She too was saying, ah, thank you. But help me plan it very well, you. Help me plan it very well, you. And then, you know, at night when they were saying that, you will go into it. say, ah, I just think we don't know. They say, don't worry. That's a perfect arrangement. And then she went in. And Jacob slept with her. And listen, there was a principle. Once you have slept with somebody in sexual relationship, at their time, you are married to the person. Hello? Look at the person beside you and just say, uh huh. You know what we have turned sex to now? He said, no, 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 I don't want to say about but you have slept with her. Who else will accept her? You have defied her. You have spoiled her. So you're going to marry her. If you want to marry the younger sister, then serve for another seven years. And the man was saying, yes, that's the one I love. That's the one I love. And I thought that if Leah had been wiser, she would have known that her family have pushed her into a regret and sorrow for the rest of her life. 
Time will not permit me to go through with you in this scripture for you to discover that till Leah died, her husband never loved her. Must I marry you? Despite the fact that Rachel had no child initially, and it was this same Leah that was producing children for Jacob. And yet, in spite of the fact that she became very fruitful in the house of Jacob, the husband never loved her. Let me beg you. Any marriage you will enter into and you will regret, even if it remains a day for you to enter it, may God scatter the arrangement. I see people desperate to marry. Desperate. Some say, hey, all my mates are married. What am I still doing? Some say, some of my mates are already having children. How can the child of my friend be calling me auntie? Pastor, you don't understand what I'm talking about. And so they are desperate. But you see, out of desperation, Leah was pushed into a marriage until she died. When you look at the way she was even naming her children, you will discover that the names were also names that shows that this woman kept looking for love, which she never was able to get till she died. Let me challenge you that the topic again is must I marry you? Now I said when I was doing the introduction, I said sometimes those who want to marry a person, a lady or a man, you see them mounting pressures upon your life as if to say, look, you just have to marry me. Some, I said, will come and be crying. Some men will even be prostrating. And say, without you, my life is useless. If you don't marry me, you will break my heart. And then you see all kinds of things. Some come and say, I know God told me. And if you disobey God, God will kill you. So you better obey God now. You better obey God now. And then they bring all kinds of things to threaten to frighten, to cajole a person into marriage. But let me give you these three principles first and foremost. Number one, make sure that you will never be intimidated into marriage with anybody. Tell your neighbor, don't be intimidated. Now, don't allow anybody to intimidate you into marriage. Whether by saying, look, uh, men, are, men, are, men are few in the world. If you miss me, then you may miss forever. Don't allow anybody to intimidate you. A lady comes and says, Look, <laughs> I know what has been in your life, and if you say you are not marrying me again, no problem. No. But before you can get somebody like me, anyway, I don't want to talk. That is intimidation. Don't allow anybody to intimidate you. Number two, never marry out of pity. What did I say, everybody? Don't marry out of pity. Don't marry out of pity. If somebody is shedding crocodile tears, let him carry his tears away. Don't marry out of pity. Now, because when you get married out of pity, you can't sustain marriage with pity. It is you that will eventually begin to live to regret what you have done. So don't marry out of pity. It doesn't matter who the person is. You know, sometimes people will be coming and they say, you see, and we want you to think very well because if you don't marry her now, she will go and kill herself and we want you to think of this. Uh, she comes from a very poor family and they have been suffering and you are the only one now that has come to her life and uh, she has found joy. You see, we want you to think. Just everything she has done, even though she's this thing, just forgive her. Just, and they are begging you. Don't, 
marry out of pity. Otherwise, you may live to regret it. Number three, don't marry based on human recommendation without divine approval. Don't marry based on human recommendation without divine approval. It was the family that stood and they said, Look, Leah, we want you to marry this man. Don't mind your sister. We will package you for him. And Leah herself did not take time to think and to reason. Don't marry based on human recommendation without divine approval. Now, so no matter the pressure, no matter the condition of the person, no matter the recommendation, the question again that we are looking at is, must I marry you? And the response to the question, I want to go ahead now. Must I marry you? And number one, I say no, except you are genuinely born again. Must I marry you? No, except you are genuinely born again. You know why this is important? The book of 2 Corinthians chapter 6, from verse 14 to verse 18. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14 to 18. The Bible says from verse 14, He said, Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. He said because there is no fellowship between light and darkness. There is no concord between Christ and Belial. There is no union between a believer and an unbeliever. A believer and an infidel. So must I marry you? No. Except you are genuinely born again. Now some of you may ask me and say, Pastor, why is that important? Now it is important because when you marry an unbeliever, anybody that is not truly born again is a child of the devil. Hello? Hello? Are you hearing me? Now when you read the book of John, chapter 3, and verse 36, you will hear the Bible saying, He that has the Son, have life. But he who does not have the Son, Jesus, does not have life. But the wrath of God is upon his head. So when you marry a person who is not born again, who is not a child of God, then you know that you have married somebody that is carrying what? The wrath of God. You have married somebody that is carrying the wrath of God. And you remember Jesus speaking in John chapter 8. And he was saying, you are of your father, the devil. For he is a murderer. And he does not abide in the truth. Now anybody that marries a non-believer, you have married a child of the devil. And the devil then becomes your father-in-law. And all his demons, they become your brother-in-laws and sister-in-laws. And they can gain access to your family, to your marriage at any time. Tell your neighbor, don't marry a non-believer. Tell your neighbor, I hope you are not an unbeliever yourself. I, I, I really hope you are born again. Tell that your neighbor, if you are not born again, today is your day. You can give your life to Jesus here and now. Now you need to know that. Don't get married to an unbeliever. It says, don't be unequally yoked together with unbeliever. I can tell you stories. By the grace of God, we cancel people that are married. Those who get married to unbelievers, they see fire. Number one, an unbeliever will not be committed to you. You get married to a man that is an unbeliever, you can be sure that he may marry a second wife and third wife and fourth wife. And there is nothing you can do than to be crying. But you didn't tell me this before. I used to think that you are serious. And he says, well, if you are not ready to stay, do what? You can go. I say, where will I pass to after three children? Where will I pass to? And then it becomes a problem. If you get married to a non-believer, another thing is that he will just be beating you like anything. One woman came to me recently and said, in fact, the way he is beating me, 
the way, in fact, I cannot tell. And I don't know. I said, may God help you. She said, I feel like living. I said, to where? <laughs> where will you live to? You stay there. When you marry a non-believer, your life is in danger. If you are a man and you marry a non-believer, your life is also in danger. Serious danger. You know, yesterday we were watching La Beoro, myself and my wife, before we slept. An unbeliever lady is going to be a useless lady. You need to also understand that. A lady was quarreling with her husband and she passed out of the house and came back again and said, the baby I born, I must carry my baby and took the baby away. I was sleeping with another man somewhere. And the man carried her baby and went and slaughtered the baby. With knife, slaughter, cut the neck, they show it. In fact, my wife couldn't see, my wife had to close her eyes. An unbeliever is an unfaithful person. They showed another woman in her husband's house. Now, she was relating with a man before in the morning. They were planning to wed. Then they had misunderstanding, they broke up. She came to Lagos and married another person. Now, she has been in her husband's house for many years. Then the lorry man came to Lagos and when he learned that she was in Lagos, went back to Lorry and he was asking her friends, do you know her phone number? Collected her phone number, came to Lagos, called her and said, now I am in her papa, come and see me. And a, a married woman left her husband's house to go and see a former... And then... They, they started their relationship again. And regularly they meet in an hotel. And the husband doesn't know. But that one now use, I don't know the type of juju, to sleep with her. And after sleeping with her with juju, every day, everywhere she is, she'll be hearing that man talking to her. Not Dimo. Even where they were interviewing her, she was saying, he's talking to me now. <laughs> and that man said, but we, we are not hearing. She said, you cannot hear. <laughs> and they were asking her, what is he saying? He was saying, you have come to expose me. I will kill you. So they now asked her, all this story now you are saying, did, have you told your husband? She said, I have told him. I just told him. After all these things became very complex. You see, when you marry a non-believer, your life is not safe. Your life is exposed. The reason is because a non-believer is a child of the devil and we only dance to the tune of his or our father. And that's why I want to challenge you. I want to encourage you. If you are also seated there and you are not yet born again, you have not given your life to Jesus. I'm not talking about going to church. Amen? I'm not talking about religion. I was telling somebody this morning, I said it's not religion. I was born a Baptist, but I was not born again until 1979. And yet I was going to church. And yet I was in the choir. And yet I was in a drama group of the church. But I was not born again. But in 1979, the Lord arrested my heart. And I gave my life to Christ. And I became a brand new person. And the same God who saw me and arrested me and changed me, he will visit your life today. In the mighty name of Jesus. Don't marry a non-believer. Now that's the first thing. Must I marry you? I said no, I will not marry you except you are genuinely born again. Number two, must I marry you? No, except your God is my God. Must I marry you? I said no. Except your God is my God. You know when Ruth was speaking in Ruth chapter 1 verse 16. She said unto Naomi. She said your people shall be my people and your God shall be my God. Now before you agree to marry anybody. Except your God is my God. Ruth chapter 1 verse 16. 
Your God shall be my God. Now before you agree to marry anybody, you must be sure that it is the same God that you serve that that person is serving. Hallelujah. It is the same God that you serve that that person is serving. Now I believe that the God I'm serving, for example, says all fornicators and all adulterers will go to they will have their part in the lake of fire. The judgment of God is upon them. Now, I want to marry a lady. And then, as we are courting, along the line, the lady begins to now say, Excuse me, um, Mike. Honestly, I don't understand you. You'll be saying, I love you, I love you, but you are not showing it. As in showing it. And then I say, well, I don't know what you are talking about. She said, well, I don't think I need to teach you. You are a man now. No necking. No hugging. I mean, no. I said, doing something. I said, but you know I'm a Christian. I said, well, God is not against that anyway. After all, God knows that the two of us will marry ourselves then i know that we are serving different gods i won't marry you except my god is the god that you are serving so once i discover that you are holding to another god you believe another principle you believe another doctrine that is anti-bible that is anti-scripture i better run away from you otherwise you're going to mess up my life you see, that's why people get married. And maybe after one year, two years, there's no child. And the woman is saying, well, my God is able, is able. I know he is able. I know our God is able to carry us through. I know that God is able to do it. And the husband come and say, well, heaven help those who help themselves. You see, my mother just sent this thing. That if you drink this one and use the other one to rub your stomach, baby will come. Are they serving the same God? No, you are not talking to me. Now, so I cannot marry you except my God is the same God that you serve. Now, the reason is because when you get married to somebody who is serving another God, I'm not talking about an idol worshiper now. Don't, don't, don't get it from that concept. The two of you may even be saying you are Christians. The two of you may even be going to the same church. But you discover that it is not the God you are serving that this person is serving. Because if it's the same God, then we will believe the same thing. Our faith will be based on nothing but the word of God. When you are trying to discuss with somebody and you are saying, you see, this thing we are trying to do is not good. The Bible says... And the person said, let us put the Bible aside. Run away. Then I know that my God is not your God. Must I marry you? I say no, except my God is your God. Number three, must I marry you? No, except I am sure that God is leading me to you. Must I marry you? No, except I am sure that God is leading me to you. I have said, don't let anybody pressurize you. Don't let anybody intimidate you. Don't marry out of pity. Have you prayed? Have you sought the face of God? Am I sure that God is leading me? If I'm not sure, I'm not going to marry you. I remember, like I told you when I was giving the welcome address, you know, I was playing with a lady in Ife when I was still in the university. And we were, we used to share a problem. We would pray together, we would pray together, we would pray together. After about two years or so, I called her and I said, this is your marital problem that we have been praying about. Is God not saying anything? And then she looked at me and said, God has answered one year ago. Ah, I said, you didn't tell me. Who is the person? And she said, well, go and ask God. Ah. 
I said me. <laughs> I should go and ask God about who you will marry. You tell me. She said, I will not tell you. Go and ask God. God will tell you. I didn't know she was talking about me. And then she looked at me. After we were dragging it for about 45 minutes, she now said, well, since you are maintaining pressure, you are asking. What if I tell you that you are the one that has been delaying the answer? And my heart did bah. I said, what does that mean? She said, I know you won't believe it, but you are the one. And I laughed initially. <laughs> I called her name. I said, I hope you know that you are five years older than me. She said, yes, I know. Don't I respect you? Don't I honor you? <laughs> and then she kept talking. And I said, look, I have so many brothers ahead of me. And I don't see myself getting married now, even the next few years. And she looked at me and said, I'm ready to wait. <laughs> then I said, look, look. I kept saying things and she was just dribbling me like that. Then finally I said, for your information, God is not leading me to marry you. I am not going to marry you. And she said, then I will remain a missionary for the rest of my life. I said, praise God. The number of messengers of God will increase. It was tough. Very, very tough. Now, must I marry you? No! Except I am sure that God is leading me to you. You know, I told you about my elder brother. Somebody that came to her and said, Look, I mean, came to him. And said, hey, God said you are my husband. My brother said, I have prayed. God is not talking to me about you. I don't even know who I'm going to marry now. But then eventually he knew and he went to propose to his wife and that one eventually agreed and immediately the other sister had it. She went to the other sister, traced her and told her and said, if you don't leave my husband, you will die. And I'm sure she was still going to pray, die, 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 die. Up till now, she has not died. And she will not die. <laughs> she will live long with her husband. Must I marry you? No! Except I am sure that God is leading me to you. You know in Proverbs chapter 3, from verse 5 to 7, the Bible says you should not live unto your own understanding. In all your ways you should acknowledge him, and he shall direct your path. So, don't pressurize me. Allow God to direct my path. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5 to 7. Allow God to direct me. If I'm sure that God is directing me, if I'm sure that God is leading me, then I can stand on that. I remember that after I proposed to my wife, and we started our courtship, I, then I used to have one um, photo album. So, at the inner cover of the front page, I put my passport. And I put a passport under it. And I wrote, she is my crown. That was the day she came, she saw it, and she wrote, he is my head. So she used arrow to point to that one. Me, I use arrow to point to this one. One sister came to visit me one Saturday. As soon as she came from one church in Lagos, I don't want to mention. And she said, ah, good morning, sir. Good morning. I said, ah, how are you, sister? I said, oh, you are welcome. And then she sat down. Would you like to take a drink? I went to the kitchen. I brought uh, whether Coca-Cola or something for her. And I gave her the album before I went to the kitchen. Before I brought the Coca-Cola, she had carried her bag. And she said she was going. Ah. I said, why? You didn't tell me you will not stay. I've gone to bring this. So she said, ah, I will see you later. I said, I'll see you. I'll see you. I didn't know that the picture she saw was what put her into trouble. 
The following Saturday, two brethren came from our church and they said, God sent them to me. So I sat them down and one of them said, Sir, can you please go and bring your Bible? Ah. So I went and carried my Bible. So they started, they said, I should open to somewhere in the book of Isaiah. I opened. And they read, There is no peace, no woe unto him that said, Thus said the Lord, when the Lord has not spoken. We read the first one. They said, We should go to Ezekiel. We read another woe to him that said, Thus said the Lord, when the Lord has not spoken. <laughs> they went to Jeremiah, another woe unto him. So, <laughs> after the third one, I now said, Excuse me. All this woe, woe, woe. <laughs> what is the reason for woe? I want to know. And then they said, they are saying it because what they have come to tell me, they are very sure that it is God that sent them. That if it is not God, that's why they are saying woe unto them. I said, so what did God send you? You don't need to curse yourself. Then they said, you see, this brother is a dreamer, and his dream always comes to pass. I said, okay. They said, he had a dream about a year ago that you married somebody, and that the marriage was successful, the marriage was beautiful, the marriage was this and that. I said, okay, we thank God. They said, but now, he has had another dream now. And that dream is showing that instead of marrying the other sister, it is another person you marry. And it is regret and crying and sorrow and weeping. People even gather, they are weeping with you. I said, eh. So they said, so God said we should come and warn you. I said, okay, no problem. I said, do you know the first sister that I'm supposed to marry, go, go, go? They said, yes, that God showed them. God showed them. I said, okay. I said, but the one I really marry, do you know that one? They said, that one they don't know. I said, okay. Can you tell me the one I supposed to marry? Go, 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 go. And I described it was that sister that came last Saturday. They now mentioned that name. I said, okay. I now know the person that sent the prophet. They frightened me with the prophecy. Now look, that is the person. But you see, I just discovered that in my heart, because I knew what God was saying to me, I didn't feel any fear. I just looked at them, I said, any other story? They said, that is all we have come to say. I said, thank you very much. Can we pray together? And I prayed for them. I just said, God, they have told me what they think you sent them. Lord, if you did not send them, have mercy on them. I thank you for the boldness and the courage they have. As they go, give them peace. And go with them. In Jesus' name. And I send them away. But you see, I stood my ground. Because I knew that I prayed. And I knew that God was leading me to marry Adenike, Oluhinka, Babatunde, and not, and not the person that sent prophets to me. So in spite of the fact that she sent prophets, I was not moved. Must I marry you? No, except what? Except I am sure that God is leading me to you. Let's take number four. Must I marry you? No. Except I have the confirmation of my spiritual leaders. Must I marry you? No. Except I have the confirmation of my spiritual leaders. Now some of you need to understand this. That as a child of God, you are supposed to bury your head under a spiritual leader. When you read Jeremiah chapter 3 verse 15, God said, I will give you pastors after my heart 
who will teach you knowledge and understanding. Jeremiah chapter 3 verse 15. I will give you pastors after my heart who will teach you knowledge and understanding. And that's why those who are wise, even when you think you are prayed, even when you think that God is leading you to marry a person, you need to first of all go and share with your pastor. Share with your spiritual leader. Let them pray along with you. Let them counsel you. Let them examine your revelation and your, 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 your perception, your assurance, so that they can lead you and direct you in the right way, so that you don't run your life into crisis. Because you will discover this. Even those who say, well, what concerns my pastor? Eh, after all, what did the pastor tell before he did his own? And then they, will, they go ahead. When they enter into trouble, where do they run? I want to hear you. It is the same pastors that they despise that they will run back to. I don't know how many of you are seated here. And you are living what I call a spiritual rebellious life. It's a rebel that stays in a place and then you are taking such a huge step of marriage. And you say, well, what concerns them? What concerns them? What concerns them? And then you just carry on without getting their counsel, their advice, and let them back you up with prayers. So must I marry you? When somebody wants to marry you and you say, well, uh, I cannot say yes to you. I need to go and discuss with my pastor. And the person says, no, 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 no. What concerns your pastor about this matter? Come on, forget your pastor. Is it a pastor that is going to live in this marriage with you? You see, you don't need any pastor. Even myself, I'm a pastor. I have spoken. God has spoken. That person is a devil. Run away from him. You run very fast. Must I marry you? I say no. Except I get a confirmation of my spiritual leaders. Proverbs 22 verse 15. Don't forget the scripture. Proverbs 22 verse 15. When you wander away from the path of understanding, you are going to dwell in the congregation of the dead. You need to see the counsel of those who can advise you, who can counsel you, so that you will not run your life into error. Of course, you know that in Proverbs chapter 15, rather now verse 22, the Bible says, where there is no counsel, purposes are defeated, but in the multitude of counselors, they are safety. Proverbs 15 verse 22. If you read it from the Good News Translation, the Bible says, Get all the advice you can. Tell your neighbor. And you will succeed. Without it, you will fail. But I pray you will not fail. I didn't hear your amen. Let me hear your amen loud and clear. Get all the advice you can. And you will succeed. So go for cancer. Don't just say, well, somebody has come. So many people have come to me and they will come and say, I've seen the person I want to marry. And I say, who is the person? And they will mention a name. And I say, is he a Christian? And they say, ah. <laughs> you know I can't marry somebody that's not a Christian now. In fact, for your information, he's a redeemer. <laughs> he's a redeemer. I say, ah. Satan can go to redeem. Satan can go to baptize. Satan, is that's not the issue. Is the person born again? We're not talking about church. We are talking about the personality. Is that person born again? I want daily say, um, not just uh, this thing. In fact, it's even a Sunday school uh, teacher in their church. I say, okay, what's the name of the church? Okay, go and bring him. And then you see the guy as we're talking. I say, okay, what's the name of your parish? And then they just mention one funny parish. Mention a parish that you don't even know that by the grace of God, because some of us move around, we know so many places. And I say, okay, okay, who is the pastor of that parish? And actually, then you know that eh, they used to change pastor many times in redeem. So, actually, <laughs> actually. And meanwhile, I know that they have not changed the pastor. Deceiver. It's only those who are wise that they say, no, 
I cannot marry you except I have sought the counsel of my spiritual leaders and I get their confirmation. Must I marry you? I say no, except I have the confirmation of my spiritual leader. Okay, the next one. Must I marry you? No, except you are someone I can trust. Must I marry you? I say no, except you are someone I can trust. That's one of our daughters in the faith who was in courtship with a young man. And the man had told her, I am always at home, only on Tuesdays. It's only on Tuesday you can see me. So the lady used to visit him only on Tuesdays, if she wants to. One day, we don't know what really pushed her to visit him on Thursday. And she met another lady tied to her. And the guy came and said, Ah, but today is not Tuesday. <laughs> but today is not Tuesday. And she said, Okay, so Tuesday is my own appointment. This is the person for Thursday. And he said, hey, You have not even asked me questions. Did I do anything with her? You didn't do anything with somebody tied to her. Hey, is it not that uh, she was just uh, passing when one Okada jumped inside water and splashed water on her? And because it's the front of our house, this is the only place. <laughs> if I can't trust you, I cannot marry you. Must I marry you? You now ask me, why is that very important? Trust is a serious foundation for any marriage that is going to succeed. Talking about the virtuous woman in Proverbs chapter 31, in verse 11, the Bible says, The heart of her husband safely trusts in her. The heart of her husband safely trusts in her. Must I marry you? I said, No, I will not marry you except. You are somebody I can trust. When you read Proverbs chapter 25 verse 19, Proverbs chapter 20 verse 6, confidence in an unfaithful man is like a foot that is out of joint. Don't get married to somebody that cannot be trusted. Proverbs 25 verse 19, Proverbs chapter 20 verse 6. Must I marry you? No, except you are someone I love. Must I marry you? No, except you are someone I love. Of course, you remember Proverbs chapter 29, verse 15 that we have read. It was Rachel that Jacob loved. Jacob did not love Leah at all. But Leah allowed herself to be arranged and packaged for, Rachel, for Jacob. Until she died, she never see the love of her husband. So, must I marry you? No, except you are someone I love. Now, sometimes people have come to tell me, and they say, Sir, eh, but you see, sometimes there may not be love at the initial time, but eventually the love is supposed to develop. If love does not develop, don't marry you. Don't marry out of frustration and say, well, uh, even though I don't love him more, but I think you really need God. Tabaradon, Afin, Obeshebo. Don't do that. Because that's the person you're going to live with for the rest of your life. Till death do you part. Must I marry you? I say no, except you are someone I love. Must I marry you, another one? No, except you are someone I can agree with. Amos chapter 3 verse 3. Amos chapter 3 verse 3. Two cannot work together except they agree. Must I marry you? No. Except you are someone I can agree with. Some have come to me and they say, Sir, since we started this courtship, me and himself, we never agree on anything. Anytime we are discussing, we end up quarreling. We end up fighting and all that. If you can't agree with somebody in courtship, you will never agree in marriage. 
That's why people get married and they are living in frustration. Must I marry you? No, except to have someone I can agree with. Again, I ask, must I marry you? No, except to have someone who believes in me and respects me. No, except you are someone that believes in me and respects me. Now, what does that say to you? Don't marry anybody that does not believe in you. Don't marry anybody that does not respect you. Because when you marry such a person, your life will be frustrated. If you don't respect me, then there's no basis for marriage. When you are reading the book of 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7, apart from the fact that we know that Colossians chapter 3, verse 19, said that women, verse 18 rather, that women should submit to their husband. They should honor their husband. They should respect their husband. We also know that 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7, also said that men should honor their wives as they honor weaker vessels. Of course, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21, the Bible says, Submit to one another in the fear of God. So you need to understand that whoever does not respect you will never be a good wife or a good husband to marry. Philippians chapter 2, from verse 2 to verse 4. When you read particularly verse 3, 4. In loneliness of mind. He said, let nothing be done to strive or vain glory. But in loneliness of mind, let each esteem the other person as better than themselves. Whoever will not hold you in high esteem, don't get married to that person. If you say you are in courtship with somebody and the person is also always looking at you and say, well, I'm just managing you. You know I'm a graduate. I'm not supposed to marry somebody like you. If not, uh, all this uh, God said. Then, you know that you are in a wrong marriage. Whoever does not believe in you, whoever does not respect you for who you are, is not going to be a good person to marry. So must I marry you? We say no, except you are someone who believes in me and respects me. Now let me give you a test. I want to hear a response now. I'm going to be asking the question, you'll be responding. Once I say, must I marry you, you will start from number one, and you will answer me. Then I say, must I marry you, you give me number two. Okay, that's what I want to do now. So everybody, and I want to see everybody talking to me. Are you ready now? Are you ready now? All right, must I marry you? Number two, must I marry you? Number three, must I marry you? Number four, must I marry you? Number five, must I marry you? Number six, must I marry you? Number seven, must I marry you? Number eight, must I marry you? Okay, I want you to get it clear in your heart. Must I marry you? Now listen. No, except you are someone who can forgive. Except you are someone who can forgive. Now the reason for that, when you read Colossians chapter 3, verse 11, it said, Forgive each other. If you have any heart, if any man have any heart against the other, even as Christ has forgiven you, so also forgive one another. Now, why is forgiveness very critical in marriage? In marriage, offenses are bound to happen. Husband will offend the wife, wife will offend the husband. Even if both of them are born again, they are filled with the Holy Spirit, they are ministers of God, offenses will come. Now, if somebody doesn't have forgiving spirit, and you marry that person, it means that every little offense you commit, that person will hold you in his or her heart for the rest of your life. And every time there's a little misunderstanding, the person will keep repeating...
ti e ba je pe olohun kan fun emi ni ori ofe so mo pele ko la koko e mo de dupe lohun olohun pe mi ki n gbagbe 2007 so ran ti february 15 Uh-huh. And then the person will begin to recount. No forgiving spirit. Now, don't get married to a person who doesn't have forgiving spirit. Because when we get married, offenses will come. I'm going to offend you because I'm not perfect. I'm not an angel. I have weaknesses. I have imperfections. And if you can't forgive me, then you won't be a very good person to marry. Must I marry you? I said no, except you are someone who can forgive. Must I marry you? No, except you can control your emotion of anger. Must I marry you? No, except you can control your emotion of what? Of anger. Now you need to understand that anger is a natural emotion that is common to every human being. Whoever does not get angry is not a human being. You know why? Because anger is a natural reaction to anything that falls below your standard or anything that you don't like. It's a natural reaction. So you need to understand that what is bad is not anger. What is bad is what anger makes you to do. And there are two things that anger can make you to do that are wrong. Number one, it is for you to open your mouth and say what is wrong. God told Moses, as the people of Israel were complaining, Give us, give us water to drink, give us water to drink. Have you brought us here to kill us? God said, okay, go and speak to the rock. That water may do what? that water may come out. And he took his rod. As he came to the rock, he said, Now, you these stiff-necked people, and you are not a little late. And God said, That is nonsense. Now, what made him to say that one? I want you to answer me. <laughs> Hunger. He was hungry. And then he said, Must we bring water out of the rock for you? Is he the one that will bring water out of the rock? Must we bring water? You know, when you are angry, you'll be talking nonsense. Must we bring water? And God said, wow, this man did not respect me before the people. And he carried the stick and said, is it not water you want? Beer, beer. Now, water came out. They got to resort. But he has terminated his own divine appointment. So, it is not anger that is the problem, but what anger makes you to do. Those who cannot control their anger, they misbehave. Now, when you are studying scriptures, the Bible says, do not make friends with an angry man. Otherwise, you are going to learn his ways. And so, when it comes to the issue of marriage, Proverbs 22, verse 24, Proverbs 22, verse 24, and Proverbs 21, verse 29, Make no friend with an angry man. Don't go into courtship with an angry woman. Don't keep relationship with an angry person. Otherwise, you're going to learn the way of that person. You too will become a violent individual. Proverbs 22, verse 24. Then chapter 21, verse 29. Hallelujah. I hope you understand what we are sharing. A woman was angry as they were quarreling. You know, in fact, I just read one in Punch. As I was going to Abuja on Sat on on was this Sunday? It was Sunday I travelled. I just read one. They had a misunderstanding. Now, what was the cause? The husband was cheating on the wife, was carrying another woman. So the woman became very angry and she carried knife. And said, I will kill you and kill myself. Instead for you to continue to sleep with another woman, let the two of us go and meet God. So as she was bringing the knife, the man was saying, ah, ah, you are Lothar. And, and she was very serious. She wanted to stab the man, and the man held a ham and collected the knife. And the woman got angry and ran to the kitchen and carried hot water and poured on the man. Now, the man's body bleached. And the man, while he was saying, ah, ah, 
He said, before you kill me, I will also kill you. And he took the knife too, and So the woman was trying to defend it, the knife penetrated into her hand. Anger. You see, when you get married to an angry person, in fact, you may die before your time. So we asked the question, must I marry you? And I said, no. Except you are somebody that can control your emotion of anger. Must I marry you? I take another one. No. Except you are someone who does not give up when there is problem. Must I marry you? I say no. Except you are someone who does not give up when there is problem. Life is full of problems. Life is full of challenges. Challenges come in diverse shapes and diverse forms. They are not cut out or designed to be the same for everybody. Now when you get married to a person and discover that this person cannot stand challenges, he doesn't have the spirit of Job. Do you remember the story of Job? Did he face challenges? Did the wife stand by him? What did the wife say when the challenge came to a point? She said, curse God and die. Curse God. For how long will I be carrying your, your, and better, better? To tell me, how could you? Cause God and die. I cannot continue to endure this trauma. The trouble is too much. Let God kill you. Let him kill you and let me marry another person. Now when you get married to people that cannot stand when there are troubles, then you know that your future is bleak. Your future is in danger. Oh, I pray for you, you will not run into error. In the mighty name of Jesus. You know, it's when you get married to your friend. Proverbs chapter 17, verse 17. He said, a friend loves at all times. You know, whether the time is good or the time is bad, that person is going to stand by you. Proverbs 17, verse 17. A friend loves at all times. Must I marry you? No. Except you are someone I can freely communicate with. Must I marry you? No. Except you are someone I can freely communicate with. That says that don't get married to somebody you cannot freely communicate with. Somebody that anytime you want to go and discuss with him, your house will be doing B. B. I don't know what he will say now. I don't know. Oh God, how will I do it now? Holy Spirit, just help me, help me. And you are even practicing what to say. How will I really tell him? Oh, okay. Timako ko sope, ushia no. Eh, roti mo ni mo fe so. Ah, otu le so wipe orora no wulo fe man se wano. Holy Spirit, bo ni ma son se no. Somebody you cannot freely communicate with will never be a good person to marry. Okay? So must I marry you? We say no, except you are someone I can freely communicate with. Must I marry you? No, except you have something positive to contribute to my life. Now when you are reading Ecclesiastes chapter 4 from verse 9, the Bible says two are better than one, for they have a good reward for their labor. When one falls, the other person will lift him up. Of course, if you don't have strength, you can't lift anybody up. Otherwise, you are going to crash together. Okay, so, if I'm going to get married to you, it must mean that your life is positive. Your life is not negative. And you have something positive to contribute to my life. Ecclesiastes chapter 4, I said from verse 9 to verse 12. Must I marry you? No, except you are not selfish. Marriage to a selfish individual breeds frustration. When you get married to somebody that is selfish, your life will be frustrated because you will say, I'm the only one that is doing everything for him. My, let me tell you this story. I was in a church somewhere, somewhere I don't want to mention. And while I was preaching, a woman stood up. Her husband was sitting beside her. And the woman said, excuse me, sir. What can we do about a husband who, anytime he buy a bag of semo and bring it to the house, he will say, the semo is from you. So, <laughs> anytime you want to cook, 
He will be eating semu, the rest of us will be eating eba. When he brings yam, he will say the yam is for me. So when I use the yam to make pandel yam for him, myself and the children will be eating eba. That's a very selfish person. Self-centered. The woman was really feeling bitter. So, must I marry you? I said, no, except you are not selfish. Philippians chapter 2 verse 4. Look not every man on his own things, but also on the things of others. If I'm going to get married to you, you must be somebody that is not selfish. Must I marry you? No, except we are medically compatible. Must I marry you? No, except we are medically compatible. Proverbs chapter 14, verse 15. Proverbs chapter 22, verse 3. The Bible says that the prudent man foreseeth evil, and he hideth himself. Hallelujah. What is it? You didn't get what? The scripture? Proverbs chapter 14, verse 15. Proverbs chapter 22, verse 3. The prudent man foreseeth evil and he hideth himself. I was sharing, we were talking together with my wife recently, a family. I had to go and visit a family on. When was this? Sometimes last week? Okay. Because they have five children, they have six children. Five girls and only one boy. And the boy died last week. At the age of 31. Because it's an excess. Out of all the six of the children, only the boy is excess. And he died at the age of 31. Not yet married. Must I marry you? Ex no, except we are medically compatible. You see, when they tell people and say, you see, AS, AS, uh, AS, SS, don't marry yourself. Some people say, no, I know what God is talking to me. I, you see, God is a God of miracle. And <laughs> my faith, you know, and all that. If you see the trouble, the crisis, in fact, I just pitied the parent of this boy. He died in the hand of his father. He happened to be a lecturer in one university. A child you have nurtured for 31 years. Now, we know that death can kill anybody at any time. But you see, if it is a death that we can prevent, one will look stupid have allowed it. Granted that in their own time there was no opportunity of all these medical checkups. I tell you now, it's going to be addy foolish. I was in worry with a family. A pastor was in a pastor's house. And while we were there, the younger one of the um whether a cousin, I don't know whether a niece or something, I don't know how they, I don't know English too much, of the wife happened to be an SS lady. She was coming from the, uh, you know, the house is a duplex. She was coming from upstairs to come and see the sister downstairs. While at the middle of the staircase, the agony of SS gripped her. If you see the way she rolled down, rolled down from the staircase, and she was just saying, ah! Uh, all I saw was that they ran around her and they were using their hand to massage her body. To massage her body and she was crying, crying, crying in agony. And I asked, I said, this Robin, 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 does he remove the pain? They said, does he remove the pain? It only gives psychological relief. So managing that crisis is enough to even talk less of losing a life. 
So must I marry you? I said no, except we are medically compatible. And I said the reason is because the prudent man foresees evil and he does himself. Must I marry you? No, except you will take my people as your people. Whoever will not accept your people, you are going to be in danger of getting married to that person. Whoever tells you and says, you see, it is you I love, oh, left to that your mother, or long. Left to that your mother and won't marry you. In fact, when we marry, I would not like to see your mother in our house. Run away. I will not marry you except you are ready to accept my people as your people. Okay? We know that is root principle. Your people shall be my people. We have quoted that in Ruth chapter 1 verse 16. Must I marry you? No, except my parents approve it. Except my parents approve it. Pastor Femi Omani is here today. Pastor Omani, how many years did you wait to get the approval of your in-laws? Please, I just want to know the years. I don't want to miss out. That they kept saying no over my dead body. And because you knew it is God, you waited. You did not say, look, don't mind them. They are no registry. About so what on registry? I began following you. They are about you only. How many years did you wait, sir? Close to six years. And they kept saying no. And he waited. Now, why was he able to wait? Number one, he was sure that God was leading him. Number two, he knew that to get married to somebody without the consent of the parent is to enter into a marriage that does not have divine approval. So he waited. They were praying. They were holding on to God. I remember the mother-in-law said, over my dead body. They went and met pastors. Some of you that are from Oshodi. They went and even met Baba. Baba tried to speak to Mama. Mama said, Baba, go son of man. That one, no way, no show. But they waited and they trusted God. And today it has become a big testimony. I remember one of the weddings I came to in your church. I came for a wedding about two years ago, thereabout. And Mama called me. And she was talking about her children. And she said, I just thank God. If not for... <laughs> and then she started pressing God for the same marriage she didn't want to hold. And that's the way it is. I won't marry you. And I love the two of them. I remember several times they would come to our house. God tell me we'd be weeping. Sister... Uh, what's her name? Toppe? We'd be crying. They would say, no. They are still saying, no. <laughs> Sister Toppe will now say, but... Now he's a pastor. The church where he's serving, they put him in a four bedroom apartment. Now, Lydia's sister, they will be coming there to cook. I don't want him to fall. I think I want to release him. Let him go and marry another person. I release him. Then we will pray there. Two days later, they will come back and say, we cannot release ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> and you see, today, it has become a testimony. And their family is becoming a blessing to other people. And the same parents are now saying, God, we thank you that we allow it to happen. I will not marry you except I get the consent of my parents. I remember one other friend of ours. Brother Shola, in fact, one day, the parents of the wife, Taiwo, they, they, after they had told the lady, we must not see that boy in this house again. Then one day, he sneaked into their house. The parents didn't know. Suddenly, the father of this sister came and saw him. And the Baba said, Oh, today we, you came again. And then he ran. As he was going, the Baba said, If I ever see you here again, you this boy that is from 
go away. And also living in Agua in Apapa. <laughs> All this Agua Agua life. <laughs> Don't bring it to this place. And the Baba.